were um, out the front door by 11.10, and uh, some of you took an extra long nap Sunday afternoon, I'm sure. Um, Hebrews chapter 4, and, you know, I, I'm having trouble, me and Kevin every, every now and then have trouble seeing this back screen a little bit on some of the print, and it's, it's not because the screen's bad, Amanda's got it up there, and it's, it's because me and Kevin are getting old, but hopefully I'll have some new glasses coming soon, and I'll see that even better, amen, I'm looking forward to that, uh, my eyes aren't what they used to be. Um, Hebrews chapter 4, so every now and then if you see me looking at this screen, that's why I do that, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4, true peace is what we're going to be talking about, uh, entering into uh, rest out of Hebrews chapter 4. Um, and so we're going to begin at the end of chapter 3, and then we're going to read all of chapter 4. Well, we're going to read parts of it and, and stop and go, and hopefully I can do this quick. So verse 19 of chapter 3, the Bible says, So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Therefore... Since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished, from the foundation of the world. Now, here it is. We picked up on verse number 19. And remember last week we talked about how that, um, how in Joshua and Caleb's day, how that when they approached the promised land that first time, how the ten spies come back out with a bad report. <laughs> Sounds like some of our news people today, amen. So they come out with a bad report. That was a zinger. I shouldn't have said that. But anyhow, they come out with a bad report. And... The people believed the bad report, and, uh, and so they did not enter in because they did not believe that God would give them the victory. They did not trust what God had said. And so they didn't enter in because of unbelief. And um, God's people, the Israelites, they, they failed uh, in the wilderness as they traveled to the promised land. They failed often. They, they complained often. They grumbled. Uh, they rebelled against God, and they rebelled against God's leader, which was Moses. And so, a lot of grumbling, a lot of complaining. Um, if you ever get in a mode like that where it just seems like you do a lot of that, or I, I do a lot of that, sometimes in my prayer life, I'm like, my goodness, I need to listen. I, I'm, sometimes I'm complaining about everything too much. When Jamie prayed his prayer there, he started off thanking the Lord, and I typically do that. But here lately, it seems like the grumbling part of what's going on in the world has risen up too much maybe in, in us. Certainly, it has in me occasionally. We've got to be thankful even more. But, but here it is we find that, that the Israelites, they grumbled. Um, now, the wilderness experience was, uh, it was planned by God. God allowed a number of the things to take place. He allowed some of the hardships in an effort for them to depend upon Him, to trust Him, uh, to walk with Him, to uh, understand that He was providing for them. Uh, they felt like they weren't provided for sometimes, but he allowed them to feel some of that to know that he was going to be the one that would provide for them. Um, they were, uh, instead of learning from God through the wilderness experience, they, they rebelled against God. And when they came to the edge of the promised land, they didn't go in. They didn't take God at his word. They didn't go in. They did not enter in, and it was due to unbelief. Um, now, the journey from uh, from... Sinai to Kadesh Barnea uh, was it was to be brief. Uh, it was going to be a learning process. Uh, Canaan would be then easily uh, conquered and occupied by the people of God. They would enter in, but because they did not believe, they then wandered in the desert for forty years, and that whole generation that did not believe died out. And uh, I always say that Joshua and Caleb became funeral directors. They buried everybody their age. But the children of those people were the ones that actually did get to go in on the second go-around when they came back to the promised land again. Um, but again, those folks that died in the desert, they, pre they were prevented from going in because they, they rebelled against God and they wandered in the desert and, and their wilderness experience was absolutely miserable. Um, now, I look at this, what the wilderness experience was to Israel is what the world is um, uh, to us sometimes is we're like, we feel like we're just, we're not at home down here 
and we feel like that, you know, this wilderness that we're in, we just, we don't like it. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm ready to go home. When, when I look here, and I find that um, uh, where this passage goes in chapter 4, we find that what God was after uh, back that first time when they entered or come up to the promised land and could have went in, he was looking for them to have some rest. He was looking for them to get to, to their home, a place where they could be at home. Now, they were certainly going to conquer the, the Canaanites, other folks that were in there, but that was going to be their place of, of rest, a place where they would call home. Um, but the problem is, uh, we see it in verse number 2. Look back down at verse number 2. The problem that Israel had was the problem that the world has today. Look at verse number 2 and, and read it the way it says. It says, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So, so here's what you've got. The gospel's going out to people. But in order for salvation to occur... That's got to be received by faith. That transaction has to have faith brought to the table by lost people or else they will not have salvation. Same thing back then. We have a message going out to God's people. They could enter into this promised land. They had to have faith in God and believe on Him. They didn't do it. Again, because faith was not mixed in and mingled in with that, they didn't experience salvation. They died out in the wilderness. And so, so we find that... that God has this plan that he really wants people to enter into his rest. But the problem is mankind can choose to reject the offer of God. Um, and, and this, for us as believers, just completely just blows our mind a little bit that someone would say no to the Lord. Because the longer you and I walk with him, the more that we know that he is not just a little trustworthy, he's a lot trustworthy. The more we walk with him, we, we don't wonder if he's going to provide. We know he's going to provide. The longer we walk with him, the more worry seems like it's the craziest thing that you and I should ever engage in is worrying about anything. And so, so for someone to reject the Lord, you and I, it just, it's beyond us that someone would say no. But, but here it is. In chapter 4, there are three rests that we're going to see, and we're going to try to go over these really quick. Number one is creation rest is an example we see here in chapter 4. So look back down at verse number 4. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. God has always wanted man to have a rest. Uh, and here in chapter 4 we find this reference to creation. And, and, and verse 4, if you look at your reference in the Bible, it is quoting Genesis 2, 2. And, and here it is, we find that with the backdrop of what we've already read, and certainly with what we read in chapter 3, God's people, the Israelites, uh, you look back on their history just totally, um, their Sabbath rest was based on the fact that God rested on the seventh day. And we find that in Exodus chapter 20. We find that where he tells them that, that this rest that you have, and that they should, as part of the Ten Commandments, that this rest that they have is, is intended for them. They should take the rest and he had set the example for them as he rested in creation. However, this Sabbath rest was blown out of proportion uh, for a long time by groups like the Pharisees who added to it, who laid weights on the people. Um, they, uh, Jesus had many confrontations with them over this subject, and other people did too. Uh, over the Sabbath. You know, Jesus healed on the Sabbath and he did good on the Sabbath and they didn't understand that at all. Back, listen, back in their day, if you, even, if you were bleeding and you were to wipe your wound, that was work and you shouldn't be doing that on the Sabbath. So they took that and just, they, they blew that out of proportion and made it something that it really wasn't intended to be. Um, I look at John 5, 17, don't turn there, but Jesus spoke of how he and the Father both did good works on the Sabbath. You know, and, and he did, and, and the Lord did too. Um, the Jews, in fact, they took the Sabbath rest and they failed to keep it the way God said. They made it dreadful. They made it a burden. And so they distorted the creation rest and they made it out to be something that God never intended. But we see that here spoken about in verse number 4 and 5. It's touched on there for a second. The second rest we see in chapter 4, look at verse 6, talks about a Canaan rest. And that's where we get back to where the people of God were as the writer of Hebrews discusses this. Look at verse 6. He says, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, 
and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Verse 8, For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Now, that's not a, a bad word on Joshua there. He's just talking about during Joshua's leadership, had the people went in, then, then they would have experienced that rest. Uh, here we find once again this rest was forfeited by Israel. And, and let me just say this real quick, a little commercial. Oftentimes God wants to give me and you some even rest down here. And I am guilty of this as much as anybody, and we forfeit it. You ever have a time when it, and listen, we just went through a time where our whole schedule got turned upside down, right? And, and we didn't like a lot of it, uh, but there were some benefits. Some benefits were that we all probably spent more time around the dinner table together. Uh, did we, we didn't go out to the to Pizza Hut in person or the Mexican restaurant near as much or couldn't do some of those things, didn't go shopping as much. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. We, we're thankful for that, even though online shopping was well and good. Um, we, we spent more time as families together. Uh, I guarantee you if the shutdown hadn't have happened, Hannah Lowhorn and I probably would not have fished as much in these creeks as we did. So there was an opportunity there for us to enjoy maybe a little rest from the normal activity. And, and what did we do? We, we liked it a little bit, and we probably complained about it a lot. But, but here it is. God's people had this chance to have this Canaan rest to go in. To, he was giving them a place. And at Kadesh Barnea, Barnea, it was forfeited when the people of God rejected the testimony of Joshua and Caleb. And so they forfeited the Canaan rest that God was offering them. They said no to it. They didn't believe that God was going to take them in, and they said no. Um, but then after 40 years of wandering around the desert, if you study this, of the 40 years they wandered and that generation died off, the, some of the theologians that are a whole lot smarter than me calculated that at, at any given time they were no more than about eight days away from walking right back into the promised land. But they wandered around 40 years as if they couldn't find it, right? Listen, you and I, if we're outside of God's will, we can't find God's will if we're in a broom closet with it. Amen. We just can't do it. And that's exactly what happened with God's people on that second go around. They're traveling around. But finally, when that generation had died off, they go, and certainly the second time they enter in, they they, they went in, and they took the promised land, and they trusted God with it. And, and I tell you what, there was some rest in that, finally, that the generation that, that uh, witnessed their parents die, they actually got to go in and experience some of this Canaan rest, uh, but, um, but it wasn't like it could have been. You know what I mean? It could have been a blessing for more people. And I think that's the thing that, that burdens me is that... that uh, we need to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. That, that um, we never should be okay with... Listen, I think we need to be praising the Lord over anyone that gets saved. And whether we baptize one or two or 102, we need to be thankful for every single one of them. But we should always hope that there'll be multitudes uh, get their, you know, place their faith in Jesus Christ and experience uh, the rest that only He can provide them. Um, now, here's the thing... As we see this reference here to David uh, in verses 6 through 8, he kind of touches on a little bit. I I'll tell you what happened with David. In David's life, there was this future look toward a coming rest that was even beyond Canaan rest, even, be even beyond an earthly type home where they could call themselves home. And we know right now, we know right now that, that the Jewish people are not really at rest in their own land. We've got people competing for that land. We've got government saying that they shouldn't have what God gave them. Our government gets in the middle of it sometimes, and we say this or that. And I always say this, the day that our country, if our country ever quit siding with Israel, uh, listen, that's the day that we better crawl under a rock somewhere. But for the most part, our country has supported them, and we believe that God gave them that land. But even in that, that was really, even in David's time, looking way back, David could look down the line, and, and he, as a prophet, God could help him see that there was another rest coming. Psalmist talked about it a lot. Another rest coming. There was something coming that was better than creation rest, something coming that was better than Canaan rest. And the third thing we see in this chapter is Calvary 
rest. And I believe the Old Testament prophets saw it. They didn't, may not have saw it, seen it in high definition, but it was out there. Verse number 9, this is where the Scripture goes toward Jesus. He says, verse 9, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Now, here it is, we find Jesus. And in those two verses, we see our standing and we see the, the rest that we're longing for experienced in Jesus Christ. It is speaking of a rest for the people of God. It's speaking about the rest that Jesus brokered when he went to the cross and died for us and suffered all that violence and the, the beating and get, went to the cross, he provided Calvary rest for us. And, and I think here finally the writer of Hebrews comes to this rest, Calvary rest, and, and again he's speaking about Jesus when, when he died for us. And when he died for us, friends, it is finished. Verse 10, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his it is finished. Jesus Christ doesn't have to do anything else to make salvation possible for anybody ever. He's done it all. The Holy Spirit, He has some work that He's doing in that He is drawing men and women and boys and girls. And as the gospel is shared, as someone's reading a gospel track or someone picks up the Gideon Bible, someone hears the testimony of a believer talking about Jesus Christ, then the Holy Spirit, He's at work and what He's doing, He is speaking to that person's heart. And what He's doing, He is making the offer saying, yes, a Savior way back when has finished this work for you. You couldn't pay your own sin debt, but there's one that came a long time ago that did. And His work is finished. We know that Jesus, when He entered into heaven, He sat down at the right hand of the Father. Listen, you go back in the Old Testament, you don't find any chairs in there for a priest to sit down on, but we find that Jesus Christ, when He entered in, He sat down because He was done. It was finished. Calvary rest. And today, listen, if we're looking for rest and peace and anything else, it will not be found. It will not be found in trying to go back and trying to appease some Old Testament Scripture that will not give us Calvary rest. Going back and trying to, and I know believers that do this. I know believers that go back and I'm, listen, the Ten Commandments are still valid in a lot of ways. We need all of that, yes. But no one's going to go to the Old Testament and find the rest they're looking for. The Old Testament will point them to Jesus Christ in the New Testament who came and died and rose again. Calvary rest is what people are looking for. And Calvary rest is what me and you have, amen? It's what we have. I don't know about y'all, I'm, I'm thinking I'm in a revival tonight. I feel like that we need to like sing another song or something, amen? I don't know. I'm excited. Jesus Christ has provided this for us. He's the one. No Old Testament Sabbath's going to save us, no. No, listen, no physical land here on earth is our home. No, it's heaven. It's about going to heaven. And I'm thankful that you and I are going there all because of what Jesus Christ has done. You look here and you look a little further, you find that what Jesus is talking about, he's talk, or really what the writer of Hebrews is talking about, is giving people peace and giving them rest. And today, just like we prayed, different ones of you prayed, there's people striving and looking and hungry and needing rest. They're needing peace with God, and they're not going to find it in any other way but coming to God. Listen to what Matthew 11 says. Matthew 11, don't turn there, but Matthew 11, 28 says this, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 28 through 30 is the verses that our world needs to hear today. And listen, I get that some people are thinking, somebody's done me wrong somewhere. Somebody's been treating me bad. I, you know, someone's saying I've been discriminated against. I, I get that. Listen, we've all treated each other in a lot of ways over all this time we've been on the planet. So sin has run its course. So there's a lot of injustices. You got it. We live in a fallen world. There's a lot of problems. We live in a fallen world. But the answer is Jesus Christ. We're so tired of all the turmoil. Well, listen, we're going to have to go to Jesus with it. And we'll find our rest and peace in Him, and only Him. I'm thankful that uh, I'm thankful He's the only one that can provide that. Listen, we're going to stop on verse number ten. There's more we could say about when we look at verses eleven and we go further. We'll get there next week. Verse eleven on gets into eternal security. It gets into the fact that the Word of God's backing up 
uh, listen, what the Holy Spirit is telling us and what Jesus has already done for us, the Word of God, the Word of God is sounding off. The, that's right. The, the Word of God saying, that's exactly right. This is what's happened. And so I'm so thankful for the Word of God and the role it plays in our life. So we're going to discuss that next week. And we're going to talk about eternal security and how people can, can know that and, and lay hold of that. And I'm, I'm thankful that we are safe and secure, friends. I, I'm thankful that, uh, i tell you what, I'll, I'll end on this tonight. I'm thankful that old Jason Lohorn uh, was, was out there in an in a ocean of sin, floating around, uh, like on Titanic, I was floating around on a door. I don't know why she let that guy drown. She let the guy drown, y'all. She let the guy drown. But anyhow, I was floating around on a, on a makeshift raft, and I was going to drown, and I was going to die. And then a ship come along. And this ship come along, and they said, Hey, Jason, I'll save you. And they threw a, a life raft out, and I jumped on, and, and I was saved. That ship is the Lord Jesus Christ. He saved me. He put me on his ship. Look, before that, I was drowning, I was dying, but he put me on his ship, and now I'm like, I'm safe and secure, amen. No one, listen, I'm not perfect. No one's going to throw me overboard, though, amen. I can fall down on the deck of the ship, but I'm not being thrown overboard. I am saved, saved. Now, while I'm on the ship, they come to me, and you know what they told me? They said, hey, listen, we're so glad that you got saved. You were going to drown without Jesus. We're so glad you're on the ship. Hey, we need some help on this ship. Will you help us and will you serve on the ship? Yeah, I'll serve on the ship. I'm so grateful that somebody saved me, Jesus, that I will absolutely serve him while I'm on his ship. And that's what you and I do as church members. Amen? That's what we do as members of the body of Christ. We've been saved by the grace of God. He rescued us. And we don't, listen, our works couldn't save us, but because he saved us and now we're on his ship, hey, I'm glad to serve. In fact, I'm so grateful for his sacrifice. I will serve him to the day I die. And that's why when the nominating committee talks to you and you say, I'm going to pray, that's why we're coming to you because guess what? We know you're grateful for being saved and we know the Lord wants us all to serve. We know the mandate there is that really we should show great gratitude to him. That's why VBS will always have those workers. Why? Because I believe deep down people are thankful that the Lord has saved them. And if we all do our part, then we look and, you know, if we do our part, we put ourselves in a position to all be looking off the, off the bow and off the stern saying, hey, there's other people out there and we need to save them. We can't save them, but Jesus can. I don't know about you. I'm just glad to be on the boat. Amen. I am, and I'm glad to be able to serve the Lord, aren't you? Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit's presence. Lord, you have done a work in our lives on Calvary's cross, and you gave us Calvary rest. And now, as saved people, we'll serve you all the days of our life. We will say yes uh, to the challenge of, of being equipped to serve you. We'll say yes to, to walking in the unknown sometimes just to serve you because you died for us and rose from the dead. Father, we're thankful for eternal security. We're thankful, Lord, that, that once saved, we're always saved. We're thankful, Father, that we can't work for our salvation, therefore we can't work to keep it. So we're thankful that we're kept by the power of God, and we're thankful that no one can pluck us out of your hand. And Father, tonight, Lord, I pray on our hearts that you would just help us look at all that you've done and just have such a grateful heart. What a privilege it is to serve you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. Thank you for the rest that we have at, at Calvary's cross in an empty tomb. And Lord, we're looking forward to being home with you someday soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's have a